Welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. I'm glad to welcome Shane Morris back to the podcast. In this episode, we discuss our culture's confusion over gender and the crisis of masculinity. We talk about the difficulties of defining masculinity and how scripture can guide us in this project. Shane Morris is a senior writer at the Colson Center and host of the Upstream podcast, as well as a co-host of the Breakpoint podcast. He has been a voice of the Colson Center since 2010 as co-author of many Breakpoint commentaries and columns. He has also written for World, The Federalist, The Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and Summit Ministries. He and his wife, Gabriella, live with their four children in Lakeland, Florida. Before we get into this episode, let me encourage you to subscribe to Filter wherever you get your podcast. Also, if you click the link in the description below, it'll take you to my website where you can sign up for email updates so that you can get all future episodes sent directly into your inbox and you don't miss out any of the great content we're putting out. Also, if you are helped by this episode or any of our other episodes here in Filter, let me encourage you to leave Filter a rating and review and to share the show with your friends. Leave Filter a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, write a review on Apple Podcasts. Whenever you take these simple steps, it greatly helps us to get the message of biblical clarity out to more people. Well, without any further delay, let's jump into this great conversation that I got to have with Shane Morris. Shane, welcome back to the podcast. Aaron, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be back. Yeah, glad to have you on. We uh, got to talk about a year ago, and uh, and so it's good to uh, good to touch base again. You had just had a baby girl. I think you you were kind of uh, on paternity leave when we had talked last time. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, that seems so long ago. Uh, she's she's now about to turn a year old, Aubrey. Um, she's got all of our hearts thoroughly, and by all of us, I mean the three older siblings and my wife and I. Um, Aubrey is just a s- super cutie. Uh, she's a lot of fun, but you know, four kids is a lot of work. So I feel I feel like I need another paternity leave, but I don't think I'm going to get that <laughs> at this point. <laughs> we'll just have another kid. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, that's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead and fill up that 15-passenger van. Mm-hmm. Oh, we're, we're rocking the minivan right now, a Honda yeah. Odyssey life. So our, mm-hmm. we're running out of seats quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, man. Well, glad to see it, and I uh, love seeing pictures of uh, the family on Facebook and all. You got a got a beautiful clan there. And Thank so, you. So, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, you uh, you a big Bud Light drinker? I, you know, I've never been. I I prefer <laughs> beer to, um, you know, water that tastes like it came out of a storm drain. Mm-hmm. So I I never really had a proclivity for Bud Light. Um, so you've been domestic- boycotting or domestics in general, to be quite honest with you. Um, yeah, I have been kind of boycotting, but boy, way to torpedo your own, um, your own business. It's there, there are a few instances when the go woke, go broke thing doesn't really apply, but in this instance, it really seems to have applied. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, you know, on the, it's interesting for a lot of different reasons. On the one hand, you, uh, whenever you think about, I mean, they're a gigantic corporation. And so, you know, that in situations like this, it had to go through layers and layers and layers of, uh, you know, approvals and people being involved with all the various aspects that were part of it. And, you know, I guess no one said, maybe this isn't the best strategy, you know, like, uh, there was, there was no gatekeeper to shut that down. I, my theory on that is that, well, there are a lot of things to say about it because corporations are not contrary to the the uh, imaginings of the more libertarian among us. Corporations are not only dedicated to the bottom line, to profit. They're also made of human beings, and human beings have ideals and beliefs and morals and uh, worldviews. And so they will, if given the opportunity, try to advance those worldviews in many cases through mm-hmm. their uh, products and their uh, and their companies and their donations and all that sort of thing. So that's one aspect of it. But another aspect is that uh, millennials are now middle age. We forget that because a lot of baby boomers still use millennial as a 
synonym for like teenagers. Yeah. Uh, there haven't been teenage millennials for like a couple of decades now. We yeah, are, right. um, I'm not the, uh, the oldest millennials. I'm kind of in the middle of the pack, but uh, you know, the oldest ones are reaching middle age now. Mm-hmm. And that means they're moving up into sort of management, middle management, even upper management in some cases with a lot of these companies as the old guard ages out. And uh, that means millennials are bringing their worldview into it. And a, a lot of them, I think, care more deeply about what they perceive to be social justice causes than they do about the bottom line. They're idealists. They were told to, um, you know, grow up and follow your dreams. And yep. for many of them, their dream is to exact uh, justice, their vision of justice upon society. And if that means that you're going to put a transgender woman, uh, AKA a biological man on the front of, uh, your beer can, then that's what some of them are going to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's a good point like that you made that, that corporations have worldviews too, because it's filled with people who have worldviews and agendas, however you want to put it. And it's also, it reminds you of how far removed, a corporation's worldview can be from the average consumer of their product or, or whatever it is, product mm-hmm. or media. Um, you know, because you look at the average consumer and demographic of Bud Light, and it seems like that is a pretty wide gap. <laughs> you could say that. Uh, yeah. You could do some archaeology based on where you find cans and bottles of Bud Light. Uh, and, I, and I think if you looked at the districts where the most of them are kind of lying at the, on the ground or at the bottom of rivers or whatever, uh, <laughs> it would be deep red areas. Let's just put it that way. Uh, it yeah. wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the, the blue corridors, the heart of democratic constituencies. So yeah, it's a, it was a major miscalculation because their customer base is clearly not on the same page with their management ideologically. Yeah. I think it reveals even more too about just the reason, you know, like, so let's say they want to push some kind of a quote unquote woke, uh, worldview or agenda through their marketing, uh, of all people to choose Dylan Mulvaney. Um, because out of everyone they could have chosen out of all the different things they could have done, you know, they, they could have just put like rainbows on the bottles. Like, right. there, there's all these other things they could have done, but they decided even a to trans put flag, a trans flag, um, yeah. or another transgender person maybe an athlete transgender athlete of some kind uh but of all people they chose even like bruce jenner someone who's middle of the pack politically he's not yeah you know he's not the most um liberal left person yeah but uh, mulvaney certainly is yeah yeah they chose mulvaney who um you know he's one of the more uh obnoxious i guess you could say uh <laughs> but but, you know, just like, so earlier this morning, I was looking at his Instagram page. It was the first time I've ever looked at it. And, um, research purposes only. Of course. And, <laughs> well, yeah, yes, obviously. <laughs> uh, I'm not like a follower, but, uh, but yeah. And I, I was looking at it and I was like, man, you know, it's just, it's weird because, um, for a lot of reasons, but it's weird because, like, he's also one of the worst at what he's doing. Mm-hmm. The, you know what I mean? At like, at like being a trans woman. Like he's just, he's right. really, really bad at it. It's a, I was watching some of his uh, videos and it gave me the same uh, impression of like, like this could have been a skit on SNL in like the early nineties. Exactly. Like that's what it is. Yeah. That's, that's how his performances come across, which a lot of people have made that observation. They've said like, you know, he, I mean, the way he portrays a woman is pretty offensive to women. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what makes it even more confusing. Not just Bud Light, but that, you know, that this, this guy has been promoted and platformed so much across the whole culture. Whenever, like, he's, he's, if you just think of it objectively, like, he's one of the worst ones they could have chosen, you know? Right. Yeah, to, to be a, a spokesperson. Yeah, it's hard because you, you have to separate the public image from the human being who's inevitably behind this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think we know a lot about the human being behind the public persona that's being used by corporations and invited on talk shows and mm-hmm. uh, running this Instagram page and everything. Honestly, uh, Dylan strikes me as a a person who's just trussed up on antidepressants, like a massive amount of medication. That's just my theory. Uh, I, I I don't have any 
sort of information or mm-hmm. um, source to back that up. But you you get this behavior, the like the over the top exaggerated bubbliness, the mm-hmm. like you said that that offensively exaggerated imitation of feminine mannerisms that you see a lot. Of, you used to see that a lot among gay men, where you'll mm-hmm. see the. Um, I mean, and and there exactly there have been comedians who do impressions of this because it's a yeah. it is a very over the top thing. You wouldn't recognize that as the way a woman sounds. Women listen to that and they go, "Oof, that's." You can tell what they're doing. It's a cartoon. It's like a, it's like those caricatures they do at uh, amusement parks where you you stand there and they take your your most embarrassing features and they just exaggerate the heck out of them. That's what these trans men do with. Um, with women, with the features yeah. and the mannerisms and the tendencies and the well, not even all of, them. of women. Like he does it far worse. You know, that's what I was getting at. Like, yeah, right. A lot of them do a, a much more believable job. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true. And I also find American transgender people are particularly in your face about that. And this goes well. This goes back to even the other letters in the acronym, where uh, you you meet. Uh, you meet or see a gay guy from Europe, and typically you're not you're not encountering someone who is as over the top and exaggerated mm, about yeah. the mannerisms as as they are in, in America. I don't know what it is. Maybe we're just tacky in general, and that tackiness spills over into our LGBTQ, pl- <laughs> yeah. you know, IA plus movement. <laughs> However, I, I, I'm not up to date on where the acronym is at this point or the initialism yeah. is, but you know what I'm saying. It's um it's cartoonish here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just it, it, it shows our culture's confusion because once again, because he's being platformed by the largest corporations being invited to the White House to do interviews and on major talk shows to do interviews and, you know, sponsorships from Nike and so on. It just shows our, our, our culture's confusion over what makes a man, what makes a woman. You know, because like in their eyes, he's a better man than you and I will ever be, as well as a better woman than a woman could ever be. Like, like so. There's just there's this confusion over what makes men, what makes women, um, and an absolute commitment to an ideology over reality. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's you can't really define man and woman in that. My political worldview ideological mindset there, there are no fixed definitions if you think there are fixed definitions then you're a gender essentialist mm-hmm. and so it becomes what everyone's uh self-expressive set of traits is however they want to you know put themselves across and um you you have to affirm that so yeah there there's an element of uh of just out of control subjectivism to mm-hmm. it where you do have to affirm that person, and especially if that person has a has a very loud public presence and a good publicity agent or whatever is yeah. the case for him, you you have to have some kind of um, crew in order to end up on so many products and so many TV shows and get invited to the White House and, and whatnot. I guess yeah. you, you can get there through Instagram. That may be the case with him. I'm not really familiar with his story, so I yeah. like most Americans. I think. Uh, it, he was catapulted upon my consciousness by <laughs> all mm-hmm. those who want me to be thinking about him. But notice yeah. what what happens when you don't have any sort of fixed sense of what male and female actually are, what men and women are, masculinity and femininity, when they're completely subjective. Um, you get this. It, uh, well, let's see where where am I where am I going with that? There are a number of places to go. <laughs> uh, lost my track, train of thought. Um, you get this sense that the the loudest voice must be the right the right voice mm-hmm. you know and in, in, in that's where that's where you get invited to the White House that's where you have the um, the publicity deals because the the what used to be insanity and this actually used to be considered you'd look at someone like this and say this person is not well this mm-hmm. person is deeply um, mentally disturbed, that sort of thing gets catapulted into the spotlight as a, as a, a, an ideal or as a new vision of what it looks like to live your truth, live your um, your gender reality. Because there are no fixed moorings, no mm-hmm. fixed standards, you actually end up normalizing or lionizing what would have been insanity 
a generation ago. And I, mm-hmm. and I say that with utmost seriousness because this mm-hmm. would have, like you said, this would have been an SNL sketch. This would have been mocked by comedians. I mean, yeah. it, it's still, unless you're um, Dave Chappelle, uh, I guess he's kind of backed off of it even lately, but unless you're a Dave Chappelle type um, extreme comedian, then you can't mock this sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it makes me think of, uh, whenever I think of how this this one person is, is platformed and like you said, pushed on us, I would have no idea about you know about him if it weren't for how much he's platformed and pushed on us through the the culture um whenever i think about how much like once again i think i think like i think there's something like uh, significant that it's this individual like i said before because he's so bad at it Mm. at portraying a believable woman um and yet we're forced to to be told or we're, we're expected to confess this is a woman, right? This is a woman. It makes me think of 1984 whenever, you know, he talked about how one of the things that Big Brother would do to break down intellectual integrity was force you to accept and affirm falsities. Like you outright knew were not correct, but through people going along with it, slowly over time, their, like I said, their intellectual integrity was broken down. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing. You know, I, I started out kind of, you know, silly with it, but where I was wanting us to go is, is here that, um, that I, I think it is, it's a, it's like a cultural brainwashing. I think it's a trying to break down people's ability to, uh, practice any, uh, form of intellectual integrity and, and get to this point to where they're willing to outright deny what they see with their eyes and what they know is the truth. Yeah. This harkens back to stuff in Orwell, like you said, uh, the control of language is the control of the ability of people to think clearly and have mm-hmm. moral conversations. It, yeah. If you want to destroy someone's ability to make meaningful moral or, um, or, or you know, statements just about humanity, then the first thing you got to do is take away the language from them because l- reality is built around language. The logo spoke reality into existence. And if you take away people's words, uh, then you take away people's thoughts, their concepts. They have no ability to sort of deal with that anymore. But you find that also in um, C.S. Lewis, prominently in the abolition of man and then Mm -hmm. fictionalized in that hideous strength where one particular scene stands out where Mark Studdock is being taken to what the NICE calls the objective room and he's being uh, told to to speak falsehoods things he knows to be false and then being sort of presented with increasingly revolting uh, I guess, s- stimuli or being told to do revolting things, things that, mm. are, that are meant to shock and dismay his consciousness and his conscience. And he goes along with it for a while. You know, he, he says this room is is perfectly square, even though he knows he, he can see with his eyes that the angle is wrong, that something about the room is actually off. It's, it's misshapen. Mm. But then there's a moment where he's told to like uh, stomp on a I think it's a picture, it's a crucifix or a picture of Jesus. I can't remember exactly. And uh, he doesn't even believe in Jesus. He's, he's kind of a, just a run of the mill secular guy. And he goes, no, why do you want me to do this? This is super weird that you, that you want me to uh, defile this image of Christ. And um, that's kind of the moment when things change for him because he realizes what's, what's going on there, that conditioning mm-hmm. um, that the NICE is running on him where it, 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 you're trying to condition away his humanity is what's happening yeah. and um as you as you see as, as you begin to alter language and take away concepts and um and force people to th- to think a certain way through that you are loosening their grasp on reality mm. that's yeah i mean that's that's the goal that's it's a control thing and i don't think we i don't think we have to be um conspiratorial or, or overly dramatic to recognize that that's what's happening. There doesn't have to be an NIC. There doesn't have to be a big brother in the, at least not in the earthly sense. We can, we, you know, we can agree that people actually believe this stuff and they're using those techniques nonetheless to get us to believe and confess it too. Yeah. Yeah. I think you nailed it. It, Cultural conditioning. That's what we're seeing happen. It's the, the case of Bud Light and Mulvaney is, (laughs) is so outrageous that, you know, it becomes comical, but, but that's real. That, that's what's happening. Hmm. And then in the midst of all this, you've got, uh, ordinary men who are just trying to learn what it means to be a man, uh, and to be good men, to be real men, however you want to put it. And they, they don't know, know where to genius, turn. Even. 
Mm-hmm. Or men of yeah, men of genius and intellect, <laughs> um, and they don't know where to turn because on the one hand they're being told, you know, well, this man's a great woman, you know, or this woman's a great man, uh, and man and woman don't really mean anything. Or on the other hand, they can turn and find uh, this new crowd of you know very macho, very strong, tra- uh, kind of traditional uh, depictions of manhood that teaches them well this is what a man is. And you, you recently wrote an article. The Gospel Coalition. I think it was your most recent one. Um, yeah, it was your most recent, called Savior Stoics. That was really interesting, and I think uh, is is relevant to this whole conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, so tell us about that, and what made you, what made what, what got you thinking about that that article, and kind of how it start ruminating in your mind that eventually led us a paper. Aaron, you're alluding to the. Uh, broader manosphere in your setup there a moment ago. This this oh, this sort of exaggeratedly macho at times machismo um, internet culture that's really developed as a backlash or a reaction to the, the stuff we've just been talking about the mm-hmm. deconstruction and undefining of masculinity and then the the uh, the sort of foregrounding of feminine. Uh, value to the point that it actually pushes out or denigrates uh, masculinity or men. So these guys are, it's more of a secular reaction uh, in general to that feminizing, uh, emasculating trend in culture. Mm -hmm. And you get guys who are, you know, who emphasize physical fitness. So there's the the fitness culture, weightlifting, like, do you even lift, bro? Attitude. There's the, uh, there's hustle culture. So it's like, get out there, uh, follow your path and purpose, do your, um, if, uh, do your thing, what is necessary to actually uh, generate power, influence, and wealth in society to become a competent person. Like, get off your butt, put down the video games, and uh, work hard. And that's the hustle culture side of it, like I said. And then there, uh, there are darker elements, too, to what we might might call the sort of red pill aware community or red pill thinking that's a ma- reference to the matrix it's hard to to back up 20 years and explain all of this but <laughs> it has and it, it and it really i guess its heyday was probably in the early 2010s um, but it's reached a point as all movements do where it's in the popular consciousness now yeah and so it may not be as as vibrant a community uh at the core but it's a thing in the popular consciousness now and it gets diluted and memed at that point but that encompasses people like pickup artists who are out there just trying to get as many women to fall for them sexually as possible and rack up conquests uh and all of this is very confusing i think to christian men because they see the problem that it, that these uh overreactions cultural reactions are trying to address they see that men are undervalued they see that uh, feminism has run off the rails and gone places that taken us places as, as a society that are just nuts that um, that misandry is a real thing that, that that actual hatred toward men third and fourth wave feminism just have become movements that denigrate and hate men this is where you get the yes all men idea with the me too movement that mm-hmm. all, well, all men are really sexual deviants and and potential would-be sexual predators who just lack the opportunity uh and th- there really is a a sense that a, a young boy should grow up just hating his masculinity and viewing it as a as a dangerous thing that yeah. needs to be caged and contained and suppressed. So a young man, a Christian man looks at all this and goes, what am I to make of it? And it's easy for him to jump down this sort of um, manosphere rabbit hole. It's also easy, I think, for a Christian, a pastor, for instance, to look at all this and go, that's just uh, that's just worldly, hedonistic, uh, secular thinking that we, the Bible offers something completely different that the, mm-hmm. to be a man just means to be like Jesus. It just means to be godly to, to, to be moral. Right. So you don't need to do all that, all that masculinity signaling. You can just go and follow Jesus. Yeah. What they mean and, by Jesus is a, usually a very feminized. Right. Emotive, yeah. Emotive yeah. Jesus. Well, there's an yeah, assumption, yeah. even no matter what your Jesus looks like, there's an assumption when you say that, that what that that Jesus is this alternative life plan that's opposed somehow to masculinity as a natural quality. And mm. so you pit these things against each other. I think that's a mistake right from the very beginning. So the question that really prompted my article was, uh, well, it happened when I, when I noticed how many of these young men um, were picking up books by ancient Stoic philosophers. 
and how many of the influential figures in the what do you, what do you call manosphere are writing to, about or referring to stoicism as a source of virtuous thinking yep. and um, you know masculine behavior and the question I want to ask is how should Christians approach that should we um, should we reject that or should we be open to the idea that there's something there and that just because we believe in Jesus doesn't necessarily mean we have a monopoly on masculinity as a natural quality maybe there is actually something that's built into creation by God that distinguishes men and women and that to be a good man means more than just to be a moral Christian, right? Mm -hmm. It can't mean less that I think Christianity ultimately does call us back to true humanity and true manhood or true womanhood, but there's something natural that distinguishes us so that you can say, if you meet someone on the street, um, he's manly. And what you mean by that is not necessarily he's a Christian. I think it's possible for there to be not manly non-Christians. Um, mm. And so so if that's the case, then what do I mean by that? And that's mm -hmm. largely the question I'm trying to answer using that lens of Stoicism because it's earned so much attention lately and because, well, Stoic philosophy is near the root of virtue ethics, which is yeah. one of the most treasured traditions in the West and something that Christians have been enriched by for thousands of years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's there's so much common ground to be found there um, with with uh, virtue ethics and and with you know a lot of the the Stoics, and I know that I've personally you know learned and grown uh, and benefited a lot from that thinking and from those resources and from the, some of the modern guys who are you know bringing some of that into uh, into uh, contemporary time today. But yeah, I mean there's there's so many different paths we could follow just based off that. Um, one of the difficult parts of the conversation is, well, what metric do we use to define masculinity and what it means to be a man? Is it, it does it come down to skills? Is it something that's determined by uh, just biological markers? Is it something that's defined by temperament? Is it something that's defined by life choices? You know, because uh, mm -hmm. that, that's one of the things I find because I, I've been trying to figure out how do we define it for years now? And I find, um, there, do we define it by responsibilities? And so on, there's, but there's all these different metrics that people out there are using. And so I find it difficult. Like, what, what do we look at? What metrics do we use to, to define it? Because um, obviously that's going to determine, well, what resources do we believe are trustworthy or, or, or not? Yeah, that's the question of the hour because we're so confused on this point. We're at the... We're at the uh, zenith of our culture's sexual heresy. Of uh, I certainly hope we're at the zenith. Who knows what things mm -hmm. are going to how things are going to develop from here? But I do think it's it's reaching uh, the point of self parody, um, and it, it has overreached. It's spent its fuel, and um, many people are becoming alienated by by the cartoonishness of it. Yeah. But so so we're in this moment of sexual heresy. We're 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 utterly denying collectively in the dominant culture what. Um, we've known for thousands of years, which is that men and women are real things and they're different. That human beings come in two sexes and that those two sexes have discernible traits. We can define and differentiate them based on those traits. We're now at war with that concept. Uh, but if we want to recover from that and and sort of step back from the cartoonishness that we've, that we've stepped into, we have to ask ourselves, what is a man? What is a woman? What are the qualities that we call masculinity and femininity? And obviously there, there's one approach to this where you just sort of put that question to the culture and watch as they, um, well, watch as they stumble over themselves, incapable of answering the question. That's what Matt Walsh did in the, what is a woman documentary, mm -hmm. which is, you know, funny and instructive and, and, and sobering and, you know, discouraging all at the same time, <laughs> depending on which scene you're watching. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that's useful, but you notice at the end of that documentary, he comes down to, well, I still don't know what a woman is. And so he asks his wife, what's a woman? And she goes, an adult human female. And that sort of played off as if, oh, wow, that's such an obvious answer. We got it now. We just got it. It's an adult human female. And that was disappointing to me. Yeah. That was uh, an anticlimactic note because it's, it's like you, you've got the opportunity here to really say some, to bring in a, a rich treasury of historic wisdom, uh, um, biblical reasoning, theology, anthropology, art, culture. I mean, th there's endless riches at your disposal. And what you settle for is this sort of trite biological 
truism. Mm-hmm. It, yes, it's true what he said or what she said and that, that he, um, you know, kind of endorsed, but there's so much more to it than that. And we yeah. can't present that as if it's the, the alternative because it is inadequate. So what does it mean to be, uh, to be a man? What are masculine traits? I guess the, the, the question for me really comes down to uh, asking about teleology or purpose Um, Because I am a theist. I'm a Christian. I believe that the universe is not an accident. It exists uh, by intention, divine design, and everything around us actually has a purpose. It's there for a reason. It makes sense. It's understandable. And men and women are uh, two of those things that make sense and are understandable. So humanity as a whole has a purpose, and men and women individually have purposes. They're not the same, as Genesis affirms, because... It's not good that man should be alone. He by himself is inadequate to accomplish the task for which God created him. So uh, a task, by the way, which has never been rescinded. That's what we call the creation mandate. Mm -hmm. So how do we accomplish it? Well, through our our, uh, differentiated male and female human natures. The question then is, how are they different? And I think there are a lot of ways to answer that, but it would be a mistake to immediately throw roles out. Because it's true that what people often say, that roles are culturally conditioned. But those culturally conditioned roles are adaptations of pre-existing strengths and tendencies. So one of the really obvious things you can, two obvious things you can look at. You start with the bodies, okay? Men and women have different bodies. Men are much stronger than women. This is utterly well established in the literature. Um, There's no debating it. You know, there's mountains and reams of data that show... Um, men statistically cluster in this vastly higher area of strength, speed, reaction time. Um, just there, we are physically very adept um, at these kind of athletic tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, women have one obvious feature that just stands out immediately and would to ET if he came and visited and looked at us, and that is that they can bear children. Their, their biology is or is visibly and conspicuously oriented around the ability to bear children. I mean, some of the first things you would notice as a space alien about a female body are features that have to do with bearing and nurturing children. Yeah. Those are what differentiate them. So, um, so just on that physical level, I'm not saying that's all women are or that's all men are. Like we're just a bunch of worker ants and they're just the, the queens who have the babies, right? Yeah. Because um, we're, we're not ants. We're image bearers of God. But... Um, those two sets of features immediately get us on the right track. So we can say, why? Because we live in a purposeful universe. Why are men stronger? Why do women have the ability to bear children and bodies that are fitted for this very nurturing sort of role? Mm. And then we can, I think then we can easily dispel this notion that nurturing has been culturally foisted on women and strength and bravado and um, athletic, like like physical prowess, has been foisted on men. No, it hasn't. It's written into our very flesh and bones. Yeah. So, from that's that's your starting point. We can we can talk more about where that takes us because I do think that men and women have distinct callings, though um, that doesn't that's not to pigeonhole them, but mm-hmm. they all do come back originally to those um, those embodied differences, which by the way extend to the brain. They're not just in the, you know, the, the uh, below the neck sort of <laughs> embodiment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's all so interconnected. Whenever you ask, well, what defines a man or woman? And you look at it through terms of biology. You'll got, look at it through terms of uh, roles and responsibilities, callings. You look at it in terms of uh, temperaments. Because I think a, a lot of the times, uh, you know, especially some of the guys in the, you know, some of these modern stoic guys would usually define it more in terms of temperament, hmm. uh, assertiveness, confidence, um, and, uh, and, and things along that, along those lines. Although um, significantly sto- in stoicism, those are things that have to be learned. I think, a st- I think if you talk to Marcus Aurelius, he would say, if you asked him, are men more, uh, sort of predisposed to be stoic? He might say, uh, oh, I, I suppose. You know, those are those mm. would be virtues that we would look at and say that's manly. But he would also say that men don't naturally do that. They actually have to be trained into those virtues, like in it yeah. they have to be inculcated in them. And yeah. there I would I guess I would ask him, well, why is that? 
Marcus, you know, there's mm-hmm. something about us broken and we could have an interesting conversation. And I mean, he yeah. probably crushed me because he's a genius and I'm just an average Christian, but you know, I'd hope, hopefully I could plant a seed in his mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think that, uh, whenever, w- once again, going back to whenever Christian writers or pastors, whoever else try to address this issue, it's usually done, you know, kind of poorly. There's a few good examples. Uh, it's usually done kind of poorly. And I think on the one hand, they tend to fall into just absorbing the world's message and beating up on men and lecturing them about their toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. and so on. Or on the other hand, kind of becoming these really bad imitations of just what they're seeing in Jocko or Jordan Peterson or whoever else. So what do you think about the different Christian manhood writers out there? Yeah, that's a really good question. So Christian manhood writer, I assume well, both of those guys, I, I don't know what Jocko's personal faith is. Um, Jocko Willink, he's uh, he's one of the, the authors who's kind of stoic adjacent. He's a, a Navy SEAL uh, and he and Leif Babin wrote this. Uh, they've written a couple books now based on their experience in Ramadi, Iraq, and the, mm-hmm. the lessons they learned about leadership there. So it's a very like popular level book about applying those those lessons to um, leadership situations wherever you happen to be as a man. Uh, so I don't know what his personal faith is, but I can say that, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson is not a Christian figure. Yeah. He's definitely conversant with Christian co- concepts in many ways, but he's not a Christian figure. So yeah. a Christian... Well, what I was writer, getting at, I was getting at the, the guys who are kind of just imitating their what the the ethos that Jocko right. and Jordan Peterson put right, off. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I was getting more at, more, more at them, you know, whenever I mean the, the Christian manhood writers. Sure. Uh, or, or different ones who are out there trying to speak about manhood today. So the Christian, you know, Christian automatically excludes certain um, aspects of the online manosphere that we would both immediately reject, um, you know, pick up artistry and, and the various manifestations of sort of predatory hookup culture, uh, that sort of thing. That's, that's out. So yeah, the Andrew Tate side of things I think yeah. is, is immediately out for a Christian masculinity, um, author. So as, as we try to incorporate the insights of these non-Christian thinkers, I see a lot of positives going on. Um, we could name we could name several names because there are quite a few authors, bloggers, and and Christian thinkers who have tried to incorporate these things. I mean, so you, you've got um, so you get Michael Foster, who is explicitly Christian. I think he's a pastor. He's um, we're, we're friends on Facebook. You know, he's working on a lot of these concepts. He's written about this sort of thing for a long time. You've got someone like uh, like Dow Rock, who years ago wrote this long blog. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's still up there in archive form. And it's this just series of entries conversing with the, the red pill, um, sort of, uh, more secular masculinity thinkers like, um, uh, like, uh, what's his name? Um, Rolo Tomasi or someone like that. Mm-hmm. Where, where he said, okay, I don't accept the sexual immorality stuff, but I do accept certain of your insights about men and women. And that was really interesting to read. I'm not sure I agree with it all, but there are a lot of interesting insights there. Hmm. But what they're doing is trying to, they're trying to get to, I think, the natural truths that these writers, whether we're talking thousands of years ago with Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, or uh, today on online or in podcasts, are discovering or rediscovering about men and what makes a good man and a strong man and an admirable man and one who who you would like to follow as a leader and it turns out there are traits that make these kinds of men and the traits cannot be summarized by just saying come to Jesus and be a Christian and be virtuous the question I ask in the in the stoicism article is if it's if it is the the case that as the bumper sticker had it back in the early 2000s real men love Jesus well that kind of implies to me or it did to me then that to be a real man is simply to love Jesus but if that's the case then how is being a real man different from being a real woman mm. because <laughs> we yeah. might reverse the bumper sticker real women love Jesus well 
sure, if you want to become fully human and you want to uh, li- fully live into the purpose that God has for creating you, you will recognize that you are his image bearer. You are estranged from him by sin and that you need the work of the, the finished work of your savior and the Lord of the human race, King Jesus, the new Adam. Yes. Amen. hundred percent agree with that. Could not agree more. The problem is that's not all it means to be a man or a woman any more than that's all it means to be an electrical engineer or a brain surgeon, whatever we'd say, mm. you know, real electrical engineers love Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. fine. I, I would, all things being equal, I prefer an electrical engineer, um, you know, working on some project who loves Jesus. Great. But what I'm really looking for in him is, is a quality that actually is sort of predates that gospel event, that conversion, it, it's actually a quality that's rooted in creation, not in, um, not, not a n- new thing in, in new creation. Yeah. And, and I'm trying to be careful with how I say that because new creation is a restoration of everything in the old creation. And that means our, ma- our masculinity and femininity as well. Mm. But, um, what it means is that there can be manly men who are not Christians. There can be feminine women who are not Christians and those qualities are identifiable. So, um, I think there's a very fruitful project to be had in identifying those and encouraging them. And even if it doesn't lead to conversion, Aaron, I want to live, all things being equal, in a society where people value the virtues and the natural traits that I think God built into um, creation and associate are associated particularly with manhood and womanhood. And I think pagans can be drawn into, in some, ex, in, you know, a large external way into the practice and habit of being manly or being womanly and being virtuous overall as human beings. Yeah. And I want to live with those kinds of people, right? Yes, I want them to convert, but that's not all it means to be a man. Mm. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And it makes me think about a lot of times in when we have this conversation in Christian circles, uh, w- one of the pushback you, that you'll usually get is people who say, well, look, we can't uh, we can't make guys who aren't into lifting weights and football and barbecue feel bad. You know, some guys aren't into those things. They're into, you know, art and crocheting and or whatever else. And, and, and so, you know, we got to make room for everybody here. So you can't be so narrow with your uh, explanations of what a man is. Whenever that kind of, whenever that sort of pushback and conversation comes up, how do you typically respond and, and process that? Because I've always found this interesting. That's a good question, Aaron. The one of the difficulties we have to deal with is that we're lived in a we're living in a time right now <clears throat> where we've all been trained to think in exceptions. So um, Chesterton talked about this a lot, how we, we've become blind to general truths. The first thing we say when someone presents a general truth is, well, what about this? What about mm. that? What about me? I don't fit the and we call it a stereotype. But a lot of times what people call stereotypes are just general truths truths about the world they're they're even statistically demonstrable you know that you Mm -hmm. you can actually go out and poll people and say this is the general trend this is where men or women cluster as a whole yes there are exceptions but that doesn't disprove the rule it's kind of like the um the 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 interaction that and i keep referring to matt walsh but you know he's had some useful interactions recently uh that he had recently on some campus with with this like transgender um uh, individual and activist who who said, well, you can't say that um, all women have vaginas to the penises because I, I'm a woman and I have a, I have a penis, right? It's a, the, it's one of these, th- these general statements, or I'm a woman and I can't bear children because I have this male anatomy. And he's like, well, you're, you know, you're not a, you're not a woman. And the, the guy fires back at him. Well, there are many women who can't have children either. So you can't define a woman as someone who is uh, biologically capable of bearing children. And uh, Walsh immediately, like a good Catholic should, uh, uh, goes for this distinction between uh, actuality and potentiality. He Mm. he reaches for Aristotle and he says, Mm -hmm. a woman is the type of human with the potential naturally to bear children. Now, whether that potential is it can be actualized in the moment, whether because of age or injury or deformity or whatever, is a different issue. She's still a woman because that's the kind of thing she is by her nature. Same as a person who's had one of their arms amputated is still a tetrapod. 
right? They're still, they're still the kind of creature that has four limbs. Um, and humans are such a creature that is of their nature. You don't cease to be a member of the human species and a tetrapod when you lose one of your <laughs> four limbs, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's just a recognition of nature, but we're, we're programmed to recoil at that and go, what about, what about, what about? Yeah. So first thing we need to learn is to recognize the difference between rules and exceptions, because the world is full of general truths and norms that we need to recognize before we begin trying to take those apart and deconstruct them with exceptions. Now to the person who asks, I don't fit the masculine stereotypes. What about me? There, there's an additional dimension to that because some of the masculine stereotypes are not nature. They're not things that are intrinsic in creation. Like here's a good example, the color pink. Okay. The color pink is one of those things that I would classify as a purely cultural preference. There is no, there is nothing inherent in light red <laughs> to being feminine, right? Yeah. There are some cultures where light red is a very masculine color, maybe a royal color or that signals great wealth or something like that. Uh, in past times in Europe, green, I found this out this week. Did you know green signaled sexual uh, promiscuity? It was mm. like the the, ter the the tune Green Sleeves, which is what we put to What Child Is This, which is my favorite Christmas carol, so I'm not, I'm not knocking it at all. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful tune. But that tune probably originally referred to a prostitute who would mark themselves in the era of like Henry VIII with green sleeves because green was supposed to be an erotic color. Well, green does not have that connotation today at all. Yeah, yeah. So I think the, those things are cultural. And if a guy, if a guy today says, I like pink, I would be, I, I would not say that's a violation of nature. I would say that custom matters and that because you are in a particular culture, um, going around dressing in pink has certain meanings that you are now communicating to the other people who were, um, raised in that culture and yeah. it could be disrespectful or confusing to them to do that uh, just as it would be to, um, to to engage in any number of other external signals that we have collectively agreed for a long time signal femininity as mm -hmm. opposed to masculinity so that's that's one thing but I would also be willing to push back on a person who says and I speak as someone who's not naturally inclined toward team sports I never have enjoyed, I've never really enjoyed them that much. The ones that are most enjoyable to me are the kind of the slowest, most cerebral ones like baseball. Um, the, and the, yeah, baseball is great because there's a lot of like head game going on too. It's all mm -hmm. strategy to get the other, get in the other person's head, which is cool. That appeals to me. Um, but stuff like football never really appealed to me that much. Um, I would be more, uh, I'm more interested in being outdoors, underwater, um, you know, climbing a cliff or trudging through a swamp or like on a coral reef somewhere looking at sharks. That's what I love. Not the, not the team sport thing. However, yeah. I recognize and have recognized over the years that this is something, this is a deficiency in me because team sports play a vital role in, um, it, cultivating masculine virtues, the, the virtue of the team, the virtue of this uh, competitive drive to excellence and mastery. What what um, Anthony Esselin in his book, No Apologies, calls the rage to master. That is a masculine trait. And it's something that is nurtured and built in those team competitive team settings. And it's something that builds civilization. So don't you dare downplay the value of, of team sports. You know, uh, someone coming from my perspective, Shane, don't you dare downplay that just because you don't personally happen to enjoy it as much because that's vital to building our civilization that's a yeah. that's a, a raw um expression a raw and harmless i might add expression of masculine virtue and energy that is just natural it's good it's important so don't squash yeah. it um n by all means be well-rounded um, and, and we need to come to a place where we're not thumping our chests and like grunting and saying, if you like to draw, or you like art, which I happen to like both of those things. Or if you happen to be musically inclined, then you're a sissy boy. You know, that's, that's a caricature. That's stupid. Yeah. Look at the yeah. Psalms. David is this warrior. 
who be, who tears apart lions and bears with his holy spirit empowered hands um you know projectiles this rock into the into the forehead of this nephilim warrior um and then goes and takes his harp out with the sheep in the field and composes poetry there's this is we, we've lost a more well-rounded vision of masculinity yeah. um that that the psalmist clearly had so that's i guess that's what i'd say it'd be like recognize those truths but also be willing to do some pushback and say hey would it kill you to you know go out and play a game with the with the guys for a while would it kill you to learn some of those things and open your personality up to it instead of just being like this is me and i can't possibly transgress these borders yeah that's so good and that's all the same thoughts that i've usually had in this conversation you know i was at a conference several months ago and uh, a very big well-known speaker went up and uh yeah i won't won't say his name i i I love generally everything about him but on this one point it just really stuck with me and you know he gave an an actual anecdote of this church that would get together for this like annual family picnic and all the men would play a baseball game together and all the women would sit like on blankets or at tables whatever and there's this one guy who didn't like to play sports and uh they would kind of pick at him because he didn't want to play with them and so on and so eventually the men of the church were you know counseled that they were being toxic in their masculinity and that if this guy wanted to sit with all the women while they played baseball then that was okay and they just needed to accept it and i just remember like this guy who was doing it phenomenal and i agree with him in like 98 percent of everything else he said but i that that point just stuck with me because i was like because once again it goes to this broader conversation of pushback we hear a lot and it just rubs at me the wrong way like um because we're always telling the just for lack of better terms like if there's the if there's the macho men and the and the sissies okay mm-hmm. i'm not calling anybody out there a sissy but like we're always telling the macho men like like you need to you need to get into art more and you need to this and so on uh which like you i said i don't have a problem with uh but we're never saying to the other guys like hey it's okay if you get outside your comfort zone and go out there and throw a ball it's all right Mm. like no one's going to judge you for how well or how bad you do it what's important is that you just go do it with the guys yeah because that leads to the the second thing that in reason i had a problem with that with this conversation is like why can't we um push all guys to lean into the areas that they're deficient in Hmm. for the macho men if it's uh deficiency in appreciating art and you know i i I as well even though i say you know people usually look at me and just probably think meathead you know i'm i'm very into art um into visual art music dance all of that just Mm -hmm. i I soak it up any chance i get to love it um and you know and so like i think it's okay for us to to push everybody into their deficiencies and thinking about that guy who was was told it's okay for you to go sit with the women while all the boys are playing a game like you're hurting him because hmm. like you pointed out an essential part of not not just team sports but we could apply this to a lot of different uh stereotypically you know manly activities a big part of it is just like being with other men yeah and the brotherhood it builds the and, and how important it is i think to each individual man's uh identity and security in their manhood to be affirmed by the other guys around them yes to be a men among men and to be seen as being such. This is something that, um, again, Anthony Esselin goes into in his book, which I highly recommend, by the way, just as a a, a concise overview of what those masculine traits that we keep, we keep sort of um, referring to um, obliquely are. He goes through and he dedicates a chapter to each of the traits that he thinks Mm -hmm. define, uh, especially define men and he's not treating them as stereotypes he's treating them as actual virtues that men excel at and that are we're created to do so um but one of those is the team and and th- this he talks about how men are pack animals and we're hierarchical in a way that uh women are not instinctively so women are egalitarian by nature they want to be in a group that is all, they're all on par they're all sort of equals and they will go out of their way um, in every society in the world, you see this. They'll go, women will go out of their way to sort of express and reaffirm their equality with one another. Uh, you, a woman who tries to jockey competitively for position among women is looked at as, askance. You know, she's not. She, she's treated as this someone who's trying to destroy relationships instead of build them. Men are hierarchical, and we expect 
there to be a hierarchy. And when we get together, immediately we begin sorting ourselves into a hierarchy. And there are all these little tests and probes and uh, and, and cues we use to do that sorting, to look at who who really is the top dog here and who is who are the followers. And mm. it's not it's not sinister. It's not necessarily sinister. It can be toxic. It can be sort of like the, you know, um, uh, swatting the guy in the locker room with the wet towel sort of thing. Like that's that there there is a degrading side to it because sin ruins everything. Yeah. But there's also a natural side to this, and sin almost always corrupts something that's already there. It doesn't invent new things. Like evil can't create. So evil corrupts ex- pre-existing traits. One of those pre-existing traits for men is this need for hierarchy. And so we will uh, naturally gravitate toward the the man who is both, you know, as, as a leader, who is both charismatic and um, and physically competent. He, he actually shows mastery as an individual. And so we respect that because we want to, um, we want to learn that same mastery and then we want to augment his mastery with our own sort of muscle, you know, we want to be his posse. And then there are various other ranks throughout that. It kind of like a, you know, kind of like a pack of animals or a wolf pack. And I'm not being derogatory with that because uh, Esalen's not derogatory. He says that just as a, a wolf pack would never bring down any prey that was worth a darn if they didn't know how to work together and they were sort of egalitarian and all did their own thing. Um, a group of men will never accomplish any great feat. Uh, they'll never down, bring down the buffalo, as he says. If they don't know who's in charge, who you know, who's the captain, uh, who's the the quarterback, if you will, who are the you know who are the running backs, who are the linebackers, who are the, who who does these various roles? Because not everyone is suited to every role, and men will sort themselves into that, um, and we like it. We really like to to feel that there is an order and that there are leaders, um, and we. I think in the best of circumstances, when you remove the toxicity, we can edify each other because of that. And a, and a leader, a good leader, looks at his men and he says, I need you guys. Each of you is actually a valuable contribution to the an indispensable part of the mission that we're trying to accomplish here. And it's always about the mission, right? Women typically are facing toward each other. They're doing this, you know, they're, they're talking with each other about each other um, and about their lives and about their uh, their feelings about their lives and so forth. Again, no, not trying to be derogatory at all here. Women should be women because mm-hmm. it's good that women exist. Thank God women exist. Uh, but men are typically not looking at each other, talking about, unless they're in a very intimate relationship, um, w- at which point I think the 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 sort of friendship that C.S. Lewis describes begins to um, blossom. But even there, even there, Aaron, he talks about how male friendship typically looks like men shoulder to shoulder looking at the same goal pursuing the same end not looking at each other talking about each other it's like a when a man says i love you he typically doesn't use those words he typically when he's talking to another man expresses it in terms of man there's nothing i'd rather be doing than climbing this mountain with you there's nothing i'd rather be doing than fording this river with you than beating this opposing team with you than um, building this airplane with you right all, all, all these like the Wright brothers <laughs> mm. the great goal I'm sure they had a great friendship um, and that's because they were oriented toward that goal yeah uh, so yeah that's a I think that's a long way of saying that those differences are real they're good and you got to hang out with the guys to get that sort of thing yeah. um, there's nothing wrong with chatting with the ladies I was the guy uh, honestly and this it's very personal what you say is very personal for me because in the church get-togethers and those like outdoor we called them um uh, what we call, we called them church property days, right? Cause it was at this property they haven't yet put a building on. And so we'd go and everyone would play outdoor games and, and volleyball was fun. Cause everyone got in on the volleyball, right? The, the girls and the guys, but the, um, the, when it came time for the football game, as often as not, I would, I would just like hang out with the ladies on the front porch with a couple other guys there. And we would talk about stuff. And usually it was about books and, and things like that. And looking back, I have two, I'm of, of two minds about that. I, one side of me says I was right to be there because the ladies were genuinely, um, the, the, in, let's say the intellectual, uh, the intellectual heft of that church was disproportionately concentrated among the ladies. Okay. There weren't a lot of guys <clears throat> who would want to discuss like the inner, the, 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 the finer points of Tolkien or something. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, 
I see it now a deficiency in myself too, the mm. unwillingness to go and push myself in a uh, an area where I was out of my comfort zone and learn to cultivate traits that were being expressed among the men mm. and to be a man among men. Those are, you know, there's two sides of the same coin. It takes wisdom yeah. to understand what's going on there. Yeah. I mean, I think the best thing you can do is take that experience now and, you know, as a leader in your community, be someone who um, tries to bring the men to cultivate all those virtues, the yeah. physical ones and the team ones and the intellectual ones. Um, that's what we're doing at my church is we have a new men's group and um, we're, we're working on doing that it, uh, as men together, all encouraging one another to grow into all the manifestations of what it looks like for a man to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're doing that through meals, through hiking trips, through um, going to uh, going to see art, you know, mm -hmm. going to do like everything. Whenever we were, um, when I was casting the vision for this, I said, I want these guys to do everything. We're going to do the manly stuff. We're going to do the, the stuff that stretches some of them. Like I want everyone to be stretched and, uh, and to push into it. And so, uh, and so, yeah, you know, uh, I think it's the best thing we can do now. And if someone says, go into an art gallery as girly, just be like, just give them the bearded Chad reaction. It's like, no, yeah. it's not. It's it, you think going to an art gallery is manly. Yes, <laughs> it absolutely yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, man, we're running out of time. Uh, you're also the uh, a podcast host. You host uh, Upstream for the mm -hmm. Colton Center. Excellent podcast. You guys should go out there and follow it. Uh, any recent episodes you had that really stood out to you or some episodes you've done that stood out to you that maybe people could go check out? Yeah, there was uh, one that I really enjoyed with Ginger Duggar Vuelo. Uh, she is one of the Duggars, uh, 19 kids and counting. And I saw this profile that um, Ruth Graham did in the New York Times. I, I don't think she's related to, to the Graham family, Billy Graham and so forth, but she worked with Slate before. So she's very uh, liberal. Um, and you could tell that she wanted to take this article in a certain direction and Ginger was not letting her. But it was, uh, it was billed as a sort of deconstruction story. But Ginger has written this book um, called, um, oh, hang on. Let me, let me make sure I got it right. Uh, book it's called becoming free. Indeed. Okay. So Ginger wrote this book called becoming free indeed. And it's about her, uh, her, her process of what she calls disentangling her upbringing under Bill Gothard and ATI and the Institute for Basic Life Principles. If you don't know what those yeah. things are, then listen to the episode because she explains it. Um, that they were big in homeschooling circles in like the 80s and 90s. And, um, and how she disentangled her Christian faith from that stuff and still honors her parents and, and deeply appreciates what they gave her, but also recognizes that um, Gothard's teaching was, was really deficient and um, that, that, that it was unbiblical in many ways and that she needed to uh, untangle that from her love for Jesus and her acceptance of the gospel. So we talked about that. Like what, how do you disentangle instead of deconstructing? Mm. That was the subject of the That's episode. Good. So I really, I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. And then I'll, I will say, this is further back, um, but I'll point your listeners to my conversation with Anthony Esselin about his book, No Apologies, because, and I guess you can link to that one. I'll make sure you get it. Mm -hmm. Because um, we go through all this stuff about what masculinity means, uh, why it's good and why we shouldn't have to apologize for it and why the world is better off because it has men in it. And he hits many of the same notes that I did in the, in the stoicism article. And he's just, uh, you know, he's just a, a brilliant and highly effective thinker. Uh, if, if, you know, despite having a little bit of a curmudgeon -y streak, but many, you know, many geniuses do. Yeah. J.R.R. Tolkien and, and, uh, um, you know, I think, uh, George Orwell had huge, uh, curmudgeon -y streaks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, cool deal. Well, I'm gonna link. Uh, I'm gonna link the Gospel Coalition article that we talked about, the Anthony Esselin book you referenced, as well as your podcast and those two episodes. So, if anybody is interested in checking out any of the things that we mentioned in this show, uh, then check out the show notes below, and I'll have all of it linked there. Make sure that you go give Shane a follow. Uh, he's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, right? I think you're on all the major platforms, uh, and go give Upstream a follow. Uh, for the awesome uh, episodes and stuff that he's doing over there. Well, uh, man, I really appreciate this conversation, just like our last one, so it was a lot of fun. Thank you for taking the time for joining us on Filter today. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. 
If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronShamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast.